Welcome back to the Fullerton College Combined Pre-Press, Print 75 and 77 class lecture. This is Professor Ben Kewitt, and we are going through the PIA's Pre-Press Trainees Manual. This is the second half of Section 1.2, Introduction to Pre-Press Hardware. Where we last left our hero, we were talking about operating systems on computers, and we were just reaching to the components of the actual physical pieces that make up our computers. We are looking at the CPU and how it contains the central processing unit, and we're going to go into more details about that looking that it works with binary code. Remembering we talked slightly about this in the last video. Binary is any sort of set of only two things. When you have a two possibilities, it's binary. For computers, that is one and zero. There's a way of using base two binary math to calculate any math you want using just a series of switching these on and off. And I call it on and off for a reason. The data that the computer sees is not actually data so much as it is an electric pulse that either happens or does not happen. It's like a light switch. It's either on or off. It's not a dimmer switch. It's on or off. Anyways, your computer processes math based and equations based off of all of these ones and zeros, and that translates into all the things you do from playing fun computer games where you blow things up in tanks to using awesome graphics software to create and generate images and do layout for print. Uh, we're going to go through here and uh, take a look at the next bit. I believe we already talked about clock rate. So the motherboard is the main section of the computer. This is the circuitry that connects all the various components together of the actual processing unit. Inside the motherboard, you have the processor, you have your hard drive, and you have your two types of memory, ROM and RAM, that we will get into in a minute. This is also where you put in things like video cards, sound cards, other sorts of graphics, boosting processors, extra peripherals. Uh, not peripheral, sorry. Extra add-ons and improvements that uh, augment your computer's performance. Computer memory. There are two types of computer memory. There's ROM and RAM. ROM is read-only. That's why they used to call them CD-ROMs, because you can only read a CD. Many of you are young enough that you don't ever remember not having writable CDs, but when I was younger, when CDs first came out, and my super cool uncle had all the cool things first, let us listen to CDs, and wow, that music sounded intensely good. Um, CDs were a thing that you could not write without a special writing system, and you could never rewrite them. That has since changed, but that's why they're called CD-ROMs, because CD-ROMs are read-only memory. Memory. This also involves anything that's hard-coded to the computer, like operating software and boot systems. There's also RAM, random access memory. This is a short-term, um, um, short-term, um, man, I'm getting old. I hope that was funny. Short-term memory is the answer there. Anyways, it's temporary. RAM is what your computer remembers while it's running a program, but it doesn't remember all the time. The amount of RAM you have determines how much image you can process in terms of what we're doing, both in terms of generating and watching computer games and videos, but also in doing our types of graphics and how quickly it can process your changes in Photoshop. The more complex the software, the more RAM you use. The RAM remembers a huge amount of data, depending on what you're doing, so that your computer can show to you and keep moving on. The, a shortage of RAM on earlier systems is one of the reasons that programs like InDesign don't show you everything all the time and will default to a low resolution preview image rather than loading the entirety of every JPEG, TIFF, and PNG straight onto your, uh, into your RAM and showing it to you live. You're welcome. The hard drive. The collection of spinning metal platters, the older versions, actually have a motor that spins a hard drive and it stores data as electromagnetic pulses and um, differences in electromagnetism on a spinning magnetic drive. Modern systems now are using solid state drives, which I'm not sure exactly how they work, and they're similar to flash memory, but um, they're a little bit faster because you don't have to spin up and search for the directory. I remember my old computers, when you turn them on, you can actually hear the drive start to spin we're up to speed and it would slowly look for things. So it is faster not to do that. Anyways, uh, we don't you all use this type anymore, but many still exist that way. CDs and DVD are also storage systems to remember things. Uh, you may think that these are completely obsolete and extinct and no longer relevant to this, uh, to, to this program, to printing, to the industry, to graphic communications. But I give you the counterpoint, they're not dead. In a, in a world 
where people email files and send them across transfer protocols across the internet and across fiber optic cables through different servers and places online, <laughs> which is different physical places and different computers around the world. Those things can be hacked. If you're sending sensitive data, do not send it over the internet. There's a mantra that you guys need to remember, especially now that people are posting a lot of garbage online, especially leading up to an election. There's only one internet. Say it with me. There's only one internet. Whatever you put out there is out there. Every email you send, no matter how good your encryption is, whatever you've said is there for posterity and someone else who should and also other people who probably shouldn't look at it are able to look at it. So if you are working with sensitive company data for something you're printing that's uh, intellectual property that's not yet released and the copyrights and the NDAs are real tight, and you send it via unsecured or even secure, there's no such thing as fully secure in the digital world, but you send a secure, what you think is secure, or even you get lazy, you send an unsecure email somewhere, that's information that could be hacked and stolen and sold. Things like lists of people's customers. Those are prized possessions of companies. The last thing you want is a rival company finding out who you're selling to so that they can contact your customers and offer a discount below the rate you're giving them to try and steal them away and put you out of business. This is actual stuff that I've seen happen. Uh, there are some print shops I've worked with, question mark. There are some trade printers out there that are less scrupulous. Uh, I've worked with a little bit of and was very careful with who if you send them the wrong data to work on a project for you as a subcontract, they will, instead of just doing your job, also figure out who it's for, contact them and sell it directly to them and cut you out of the process of working with your own client. Um, ethics is not the same for everyone, I guess. I wish it was. But anyways, what this is getting at is CDs and DVDs can't be hacked unless you figure out who's delivering the mail and you find the mail carrier who's delivering that envelope with the disc inside, or unless you figure out which of the thousands of bicycle messengers is riding up and down the streets of San Francisco carrying your drive, and find him or her and beat them up and take their backpack and go through their stuff to find your disc, they're not gonna be able to, to hack that and steal the information. It is secure. Also, CDs and DVDs don't corrupt as easily as other types of memories. I know flash drives, as much as I love them, and as useful as they are, they can corrupt they can go bad and all the data on them is gone. I've seen that happen to some good students in our classes in the past. In fact, it nearly crippled someone during a competition who had to turn in their project in person and on a flash drive and their data died the day of. They had to go back and figure out how to rescue it from other sections of computers and piece it back together to print out the final version. Anyways, you don't need the whole story. But with DVDs and with CDs, as long as there's a big enough one to hold all the information you need, that type of corruption doesn't really happen and it's secure and safe for even long-term storage. There are good reasons to use them. Dual layer DVDs are great and hold around eight and a half gigabytes per side. So that's a big long argument just to say that don't rule them out because they're kind of old. Sometimes old things are useful and without letting Google have access and whoever can hack Google have access to all your information, sometimes it's worth it just to put a hard copy that can't be intercepted. LCDs, liquid crystal, crystal displays, or liquid crystal diodes, uh, as I've heard of them as well. Um, that's, sorry, that's light emitting diodes. And some of those are LED, LED LCDs. Anyways, liquid crystal displays are how you see things these days. When I was younger, it was the cathode ray tube, which is the older, thick, heavy box version of TVs and computers, uh, where the monitor would be a huge box with a glass front that's slightly curved and made up out of lots of little... Um, light up elements inside of it, which are in fact, instead of being little crystals that are activated by electrical pulses, they are tiny radio tubes full of um, different types of gases that get excited and then release their energy in different color wavelengths to make the red, green, and blue elements. I'm telling you too much. LCD replaced that and it's better and more stable. Although the refresh light rate is slower, very serious online gamers will still use good quality CRTs because the refresh rate gives you a slight edge in games that involve twitch time. Peripherals, you need these. This is how you get other information on and off the computer, things like scanners and cameras. Anyone who's around when I finally got my new laptop remembers me going off on a big long tirade that I won't repeat in its entirety right now, but uh, the newer MacBook Pros, though they're designed for professional graphic designers to work with, do not have enough input output slots. 
by use, limiting it to only one type of input-output drive, the USB-C type, and requiring you to figure out your own dongle situation to hook up things like compute and the computers, like digital cameras and scanners and uh, data drives from other people who are giving you files to work with to make these professional layouts, um, it's not really useful, is it? You need to have peripherals. You can connect with USBs as well as FireWire. FireWire is now dead. Um, USB type C is what the Mac uses now. They also call it Thunderbolt 2, which drives me a little nuts because the Thunderbolt 2 is in fact the A-10 air to ground attack aircraft. That's the Thunderbolt 2. And that's a much better Thunderbolt 2, though it's a little dated. It's still relevant. Anyways, the USB used to be not so great. The early ones could only do 40, my 40 megabytes a second. The new ones do a couple hundred megabytes a second and are much quicker for sending things from place to place. It's still a bad idea to, to work directly across a USB connection to something uh, as far as linking files in InDesign. Don't do that. Bad llama. Measurement devices. Ooh, I love these. This involves my very favorite word. <clears throat> I mean, there are plate reading densitometers and spectro densitometers. There's also spectrophotometers. Guess which one I like better. These are incredibly fun devices that will actually measure the spectral, they do a spectral analysis and measure the wavelengths of light reflected across, bounced off of, passed through an object. So you can tell using LAB color space exactly, numerically, what color something is. And you can use that to uh, control your printing output to make sure you're getting consistent output. I love these things, they are so cool. Seriously, even my daughter has a toy one. It does very simple things like a chameleon with a paintbrush, but it'll tell you in some cartoony voice, yellow, red, orange, whatever you scan, it'll tell you what color it is. It doesn't do LAB values. If I could figure out how to hack it to do that, oh, believe me, I would. Output devices, there's two types of things. There's the pre-press workflow solution and the marking engine. Let's see if I can finish this up before I run out of video time for YouTube. The pre-press workflow solution is a big fancy name for all the computers you need to do pre-press. This lets you make PDFs, check them for problems, impose them for printing, do the trapping, which we'll talk about later, do the rasterization, which is converting everything to pixels, which gets converted to machine pixels, which can get converted to halftone dots, which then gets made onto plates and or printed, and it outputs to a marking engine. What's a marking engine? I'm glad you asked. A marking engine is something that, may, that takes information on a computer and marks it physically in the real world. Marking engines include laser printers, inkjet printers, proofing systems, offset, not offset presses, because those don't hook to the computer, but offset plate makers that make the plates. Anything that takes computer data and converts it to a real world physical object or a ink smear on a, on a substrate, that's a marking engine. I think technically speaking, you might be able to at least gerrymander 3D printing into being a marking engine. And certainly la laser cutters and electric die cutters are also marking engines. Here's some examples, plate setters. Printers, hooray. If it makes a mark in the real world, it's a marking engine. This concludes 1.2. Thanks for listening.